When the war has lasted twenty years, the dragonettes will come. When the land is soaked in blood and tears, the dragonettes will come. Find the seaweed egg of deepest blue. Wings of night shall come to you. The largest egg in mountain high will give to you the wings of sky. For wings of earth search through the mud, for an egg the color of dragon blood. And hidden alone from the rival queens, the sandwing egg awaits unseen. Of three queens who blister and blaze and burn, two shall die and one shall learn. If she bows to a fate that is stronger and higher, she'll have the power of wings and fire. Five eggs to hatch on brightest night, five dragons born to end the fight. Darkness will rise to bring the light. The dragonets are coming. A dragon was trying to hide in the storm. Lightning flickered across the dark clouds. Hivitzer clutched his fragile cargo closer. If he could make it over the mountains, he'd be safe. He had escaped the sky dragon's palace unseen, and the secret cave was so close. But his theft had not been as stealthy as he thought, and eyes as black as obsidian were already tracking him from below. The enormous dragon on the mountain ledge had pale gold scales that radiated heat like a desert horizon. Her black eyes narrowed, watching the gleam of silver wings far up in the clouds. She flicked her tail, and behind her two more dragons rose to the sky and dove into the heart of the storm. A piercing shriek echoed off the mountains as their talents seized the moon-pale ice dragon. Bind his mouth! The waiting dragon ordered as her soldiers dropped Victor on the slick, wet ledge in front of her. He was already inhaling, ready to attack. Quickly! One of the soldiers grabbed a chain from the pile of smoldering coals. He threw it around the ice dragon's snout, clamping his jaws together with the sizzling smell of burning scales. Victor let out a muffled scream. Too late! The sand dragon's forked tongue slithered in and out of her mouth. You won't be using your freezing death breath on us, Ice Dragon. He was carrying this, Queen Burn, said one of the soldiers, handing her a dragon egg. Burn squinted at the egg through the downpour. This is not an Ice Wing egg, she hissed. You stole this from the Sky Wing Peep Palace. The Ice Wing stared back at her. Hissing steam circled his snout where the hot chains met cold silver scales. You thought you could go away unnoticed, didn't you? Burn said. My Skywing ally was not a fool. Queen Scarlet knows everything that happens in her kingdom. Her lookouts reported an ice wing theft sneaking away, and I decided finding you might add some violence to my boring visit. Burn held the large egg up to the light of the fire and turned it slowly. Red and gold shimmered below the pale, smooth surface. Yes, this is a Skywing egg about to hatch. Burn mused. Why would my sister send you to steal a Skywing egg, Dragonette? Blaze hates any dragon younger and prettier than she is. She thought for a moment as rain drummed on the ledge around her. Unless the brightest night is tomorrow. Her tail flicked up like a scorpion's, the poisonous barb inches from her Ritford eyes. You're not in Blaze's army, are you? You're one of those insepid underground peacemongers. The talons of peace, said one of the soldiers. You mean they're real? Burns snorted. A few worms crying over a little blood. Unwrap his chains. He won't be able to freeze us until the scales cool down. The enormous sand dragon leaned closer as her soldier pulled the chain away. Tell me, ice dragon, do you really believe in that pompous old Nightwing's prophecy? Haven't, had, haven't enough dragons died for your war? snarled Victor, wincing at the pain of his jaws. All of Pura has suffered out from the last twelve years. The prophecy says, I don't care. But no prophecy decides what happens to me, Burn interrupted. I'm not letting a bunch of words or baby dragons choose when I die or what I bow to. We can have peace when my sisters are dead and I am the queen of the Sandwings. Her venomous tail dipped closer to the silver dragon. Rain pattered on Victor's scales. He glared up at her. The dragonettes are coming whether you like it or not, and they'll choose who the next sand queen, wing queen should be. Really? Burn stepped back and turned the egg slowly between her talons. 
Her forked tongue slipped in and out of her smile. So, Icewing, is this egg a part of your pathetic prophecy? Vithur went still. Byrne tapped lightly on the eggshell with one long talent. Hello, she called. Is there a dragonet of destiny in there, ready to come out and end this big bad war? Leave it out, Havatfar choked out. Tell me, what becomes of your precious prophecy if one of the five dragonets had never hatched at all? You wouldn't, he said. No one would harm a dragon egg. His blue eyes were fixed desperately on her talons. No wings of sky does help save the world, Byrne said. What a sad, sad story. She began tossing the egg from one front claw to the other. I guess that means you should be very, very careful with this terribly important little... Oops. With an exaggerated lunge, Byrne pretended the wet egg was slipping through her talons, and then she let it fall over the side of the cliff into the rocky darkness below. No! Hivek first shrieked. He threw off the two soldiers and flung himself toward the edge. Byrne slammed her massive claws down on his neck. So much for destiny, she smirked. So much for your tragic little movement. You're a monster, the Icewing gasped, writhing under her talons. His voice cracked with despair. We'll never give up. The Dragonettes. The Dragonettes will stop and come stop this war. Byrne leaned down to hiss into his ear. Even if they do, it'll be far too late for you. Her claws ripped through the silver dragon's wings, shredding them as Vritfer shrieked in agony. With a swift movement, she stabbed her poisonous tail through his skull and flung the long silver body over the edge of the cliff. The ice dragon's screams cut off long before the echoes of his corpse slamming into the rocks below. The sand wing turned her black eyes to her soldiers. Perfect, she said. That should be the last we hear about that stupid prophecy. She held out her talons so the rain could wash away the glistening dragon blood. Let's go find something else to kill. The three dragons spread their wings and lifted off into the dark clouds. Some time later, far below, a large dragon the color of rust crawled over the rocks to the broken body of the ice dragon. She nudged his tail aside and lifted a shard of eggshell from underneath it then slipped back into the labyrinth of caves under the cliffs. Stone walls brushed against her wings. She breathed out a plume of flame to light her way along the dark passage, deep into the mountain. I stand with the talons of peace, hissed a voice in the shadows. Kestrel, is that you? We await the wings of fire, answered the red dragon. A blue-green sea wing emerged from a side cave, and she tossed the eggshell at his feet. Not that it'll do as much good now, she snarled. Vetfar is dead. The sea wing stared at the eggshell. But the sky wing egg. Broken, she said. Gone. It's over, Webs. It can't be, he said. Tomorrow is the brightest night. The three moons will be all full before the first time in a century. The dragonets of the prophecy have to hatch tomorrow. Well, one of them is already dead, Kestrel said. Rage flickered in her eyes. I knew I should have stolen the Skywing Egg myself. I know the Sky Kingdom. They wouldn't have caught me in a second time. Webb's grimaced, scratching one claw over the grills along his neck. Asha is dead too. Asha! A spurt of flame shot from Kestrel's nose. How? Caught in a battle between Blazes and Bluster's forces on the way here. She still made it with the Red Mudwing Egg, but she died in her wound soon after. So it's just you, me, and Dune to raise the little worms, Kestrel growled, for a prophecy that can never be fulfilled. Let's break the cursed eggs now and be done with it. We'll be long gone before the Talons of Peace return for the di Dragonettes. No, Webbs hissed. Keeping the Dragonettes alive for the next eight years is more important than anything. We don't want to be a part of that. All right, enough, Kestrel snapped. I'm the strongest dragon in the Talons of Peace. You need me. It doesn't matter how I feel about the nasty little dragonettes. She eyed the eggshell on the floor, rubbing her scarred palms together. Although I thought at least one of them would be a skywing. I'll find us a fifth dragonette. Wibbs pushed past her, scales scraping against rock. There's no way back into the Sky Kingdom, brainless. They'll be guarding the hatchery closely now. 
Then I'll get an egg somewhere else, he said grimly. The rain wings won't even count their eggs. I could take one from the rainforest without anyone noticing. Of all the horrible ideas, Kestrel said with a shudder, rain wings are wretched creatures, nothing like sky wings. We have to do something, Webb said. He hissed as his tail sent the eggshell skittering across the floor. In eight years, the Talons of Peace will come looking for five dragonets. The prophecy says five, and we're going to make sure it comes true. Whatever it takes. Clay didn't think he was the right dragon for the big heroic destiny. Oh, he wanted to be. He wanted to be the great mudwing savior of the dragon world, glorious and brave. He wanted to do all the wonderful things expected of him. He wanted to look at the world, figure out what was broken, and fix it. But he wasn't a natural hatched hero. He had no legendary qualities at all. He liked sleeping more than studying, and he kept losing chickens in the caves during hunting practice because he was paying attention to his friends instead of watching for feathers. But he was alright at fighting. But alright wasn't going to stop the war and save the dragon tribes. He needed to be extraordinary. He was the biggest dragonette, so he was supposed to be the scary tough one. The miners wanted him to be the terrifyingly dangerous. Clay felt as if about as dangerous as Cauliflower. Fight! His attacker howled, flinging him across the cavern. Clay crashed into the rock wall, scrambled up again, trying to spread his mud-colored wings for balance. Red talons raked at his face and he ducked away. Come on! The red dragon snarled. Stop holding back! Find the killer inside you and let it out! I'm trying, Clay said. Maybe we could stop and talk about it. She lunged for him again. Faint to the left. Roll right. Use your fire. Clayton tried to duck under her wing to attack her from below. But of course, he rolled the wrong way. One of her talons smashed him into the ground, and he yelped with pain. Which left was that useless? Kestrel bellowed in his ear. Are all mud wings this stupid, or are you just deaf? Well, if we keep that up, I soon will be, Clay thought. The Skywing lifted her claws and he wriggled free. I don't know about any other mud wings, he protested, licking his sore talons. Obviously, but perhaps he could try fighting without all the shouting and see... He stopped, hearing the familiar hiss that came before one of Kestrel's fire attacks. He threw his wings over his head, tucked his long neck in, and rolled into the maze of stalagmites that studded one corner of the cave. Flames blasted the rocks around him, singeing the tip of his tail. Coward! The older dragon bellowed. He smashed one of the rock columns into a shower of sharp black pebbles. Clay covered his eyes and almost immediately felt her stamp down hard on his tail. Ow! You said Stomping Tails was cheating! He seized the closest stalagmite between his claws and scrambled on top of it. From his perch near the roof, he glared down at his guardian. I'm your teacher, Kestrel snarled. Nothing I do is cheating. Get down here and fight like a skywing. But I'm not a skywing. Clay thought rebelliously. I'm a mudwing. I don't like setting things on fire or flap around in circles biting at dragons' necks. His teeth still ached from Kestrel's jewel-hard scales. Can't I fight one of the others? He asked. I'm much better at that. The other dragonets were his own size, nearly, and they didn't cheat, most of the time. He actually liked fighting with them. Oh yes, which opponent would you prefer? The stunted sand wing or the lazy rain wing? Kestrel said because I'm sure you'll get to choose out on the battlefield. Her tail glowed like embers as she lashed it back and forth. Glory's not lazy, Clay said loyally. She's just not built for fighting, that's all. Webb said there's not much to fight about in the rainforest because the rain wings have all the food they want. He says that's why they've all stayed out of the war so far, because none of the rival queens want rain wings in their armies anyway. He says, stop yammering and get down here, Kestrel roared. She reared up on her back legs and flared her wings so she suddenly looked three times bigger. With a yelp of alarm, Clay tried to leap to the next stalagmite, but his wings unfurled too slowly, and he smacked into the side of it instead. Sparks flew as his claws scraped down the jagged rock. He let out another yowl of pain as Kestrel snaked her head between the columns, seizing his tail in her teeth, and yanked him out into the open. Her talons closed around his neck as she hissed in his ear. Where's the violent little monster I saw when you hatched? That's the dragon we need for the prophecy. Gob! Clay squawked, clawing at her grip. He could feel the strange burn scars on her palms scraping against his scales. 
This is how battle training with Kestrel always ended, with him unconscious and then Sora limping for days afterward. Fight back, he thought. Get mad, do something. But although he was the biggest of the Dragonettes, they were still a year away from being fully grown, and Kestrel towered over him. He tried to summon some helpful violent rage, but all he could think about was, it'll all be over soon, then it can go have dinner. So, not the most heroic train of thought. Suddenly, Kestrel let out a roar and dropped him. Fire blasted over Clay's head as he hit the floor with a thud. The red dragon whirled around. Behind her, panting defiantly, was the seeing wing dragonette, Tsunami. A red gold scale was caught between her sharp white teeth. She spat it out and glared at her teacher. Stop picking on Clay, Tsunami growled, or I'll bite you again. Her deep blue scales shimmered like cobalt glass in the torchlight. The gills on her long neck were pulsing like they always did when she was angry. Kestrel sat back and flicked her tail around to examine the bite mark. She barred her teeth at Tsunami. Aren't she sweet, protecting a dragon who's tried to kill you while you were still an egg. But luckily you big dragons were there to save our lives, Tsunami said. And we sure appreciate it, because now we get to hear all about it all the time. She marched around to stand between Clay and Kestrel. Clay winced. He hated hearing this story. He didn't understand it. He never want to hurt the other dragonettes. So why had he attacked their eggs during hatching? Did he really have a killer monster inside him somewhere? The other minders, Webbs and Dune, said he'd been ferocious when he hatched. They had to throw him in the river to protect the other eggs from him. Kestrel wanted him to find that monster and use it when he fought. But he was afraid if he ever did, he would hate himself, and so would everyone else. Thinking about what he had nearly done to his friends made him feel like all the fire had been sucked out of him. He didn't particularly want to be a violent angry monster, even if Kestrel thought it would be an improvement. But maybe that was the only way to make the prophecy come true. Maybe that monster was his destiny. All right, Kestrel said dismissively. We're finished here anyway. I'll mark another failure in your scroll, Mudwing. She started a small flame into the air and swept out of the cave. Clay flopped down on the floor as soon as her red tail had vanished from sight. It felt like every one of his scales were stinging from the burns. She is going to be so mean to you during your training tomorrow, he said to Tsunami. Oh no, said the sea-winged dragon at gasped. I've never seen Castle bef that mean before. That will be so unexpected and out of character. <laughs> Ow, Kay groaned. Don't make me laugh. I think my ribs are broken. Your ribs aren't broken, Tsunami said, poking him in the side with her nose. Dragon bones are almost as hard as diamonds. You're fine. Get up and jump in the river. No! Clay buried his head under his wing. Too cold. Jump in the river was Tsunami's solution for everything. Bored, aching bones, dry scales, brain over stuff with a history of a war. Jump in the river, she'd shout whenever any of the other dragonettes complained. She certainly did not care that she was the only one who could breathe underwater, or that most other dragon tribes hated getting wet. Clay didn't mind being wet, but he couldn't stand being cold, and the underground river that flowed through their cave home was always freezing. Get in, Tsunami ordered. She seized his tail between her front talons and started dragging him toward the river. You'll feel better. I will not, Clay shouted, clawing at the smooth stone floor. I'll feel colder. Stop it. Go away. His protests wound up in a cloud of bubbles as Tsunami dumped him in the icy water. When he resurfaced, she was floating beside him, ducking her head and splashy water over her beautiful scales like an overgrown fish. Clay felt like a gawky brown blob next to her. He splashed into the shadows and lay down on a submerged rock ledge, with his head resting on the bank of the river. He wouldn't admit it, but the burns and aches did feel better in the water. The current helped wash away the smoky rock dust caught between his dry scales. Still too cold, though. Clay scratched at the rock below him. Why can't there just be a little mud down here? Kestrel will be sorry one day when I'm queen of the sea wings, Tsunami said, swimming up and down the narrow channel. I thought only a queen's daughters or sisters could challenge her for her throne, Clay said. Tsunami swam so fast. He wished he had webs between his talons, too or gills, or a tail like hers, so powerful she could nearly empty the river in one big splash. Well, maybe the sea wing queen is my mother, and I'm a lost princess, she said, like in the story. 
Everything the Dragonets knew about the outside world came from scrolls picked up by the Talons of Peace. Their favorite was the Missing Princess, a legend about a runaway sea winged Dragonet whose royal family tore up the whole ocean looking for her. At the end, she found her way home, and her parents welcomed her with open wings and feasting and joy. Clay always skipped the adventures in the middle of the story. He just liked that last part, the happy mother and father, and the feasting. The feasting sounded pretty great, too. I wonder what my parents were like, he said. I wonder if any of our parents are still alive, Tsunami said. Clay didn't like to think about that. He knew dragons were dying in the war every day. Kestrel and Webbs brought back news of a blood battles, scorched lands, and burning piles of dragon bodies. But he had to believe his parents were still safe. Do you think they'll ever miss us? Definitely. Tsunami flicked a spray of water at him with her tail. I bet mine are frantic when Webb stole my egg, just like in the story. And mine torn apart their marshes, Clay said. They had all imagined scenes of their parents' desperate searches ever since they were young dragonettes. Clay liked the idea that someone was out there looking for him, that someone missed him and wanted him back. Tsunami flipped onto her back, gazing up at the stone roof with her translucent green eyes. Well, the Talons of Peace know what they were doing, she said bitterly. No one will ever find us down here. They listened to the river gurgle and the torches crackle for a moment. We won't be underground forever, Clay said, trying to make her feel better. I mean, if the Talons of Peace want us to stop this war, they have to let us out sometime. He scratched behind his ear thoughtfully. Starflight said it's only two more years. He only had to hold on to that long. And then we can go home and eat as many cows as we want. Well, first save the world, Tsunami said. And then we go home. Right, said Clay. How they were going to save the world was a little fuzzy, but everyone seemed to think they'd figure it out when the time came. Clay pulled himself out of the river, his waterlogged wings heavy and drooping. He spread them in front of one of the torches, arching his neck and trying to get warm. Feeble waves of heat wafted against his scales. Unless, Tsunami said. Clay lowered his head to look at her. Unless what? Unless we leave sooner, she said. She flipped over and pulled herself out of the water in one graceful motion. Leave? Clay echoed, startled. How? And on her own? Why not? She said. If we can find a way out, why should we have to wait another two years? I'm ready to save the world now, aren't you? Clay wasn't sure he'd ever be ready to save the world. He figured the Talons of Peace would tell them what they had to do. Only the three guardian dragons, Kestrel, Webbs, and Dune, knew where the dragonets were hidden, but there was a whole network of Talons out there getting ready for the prophecy. We can't stop this war by ourselves, he said. We don't know where to start. Tsunami flapped her wings at him in exasperation, showering him with cold droplets. We can too stop the war on our own, she said. That's the whole point of the prophecy. Maybe in two years, Clay said. Maybe by then I'll found my dangerous side. Maybe then I'll be the ferocious fighter Kestra wants me to be. Maybe sooner, she said stubbornly. Just think about it, all right? He shifted his feet. All right, I'll, th I'll think about it. At least that way he could stop arguing with her. Tsunami cocked her head. I hear dinner! The faint sound of dismayed mooing echoed up the tunnel behind them. She poked Clay cheerfully. Race into the hall! She whirled and pounded away without waiting for a response. The torches in the battle room seemed dimmer, and cold water was seeping under Clay's scales. He folded his wings and swept his tail through the debris of the smashed rock column. Tsunami was crazy. The five dragonets weren't ready to stop the war. They wouldn't even know how to survive on their own. Maybe Tsunami was brave and tough like a hero should be, but Sunny and Glory and Starflight... Kay thought of all the things that might hurt them and wished he could give them his own scales and claws and teeth for extra protection. Besides, there was no way to escape the caves. The Talons of Peace made sure of that. Still, part of him couldn't help wondering what it would be like to go home now instead of waiting another two years. Back to the marshes, to the swamps, to a whole tribe of mudwings who looked like him and thought like him. Back to his parents, whoever they were. What if he could do it? What if the dragons could escape and survive and save the world in their own way?